Wednesday, November 20th uh, at 1230. This meeting is being taped by Amherst Media, um, and we are in the Amherst Police Station uh, meeting room. I'm not going to hand out agendas <laughs> too. For myself. Um, yeah. And dive right in. Uh, I've just called this to order. We do not have meeting minutes to approve for the previous meeting. Our meeting minute taker has had to resign, and so uh, we'll have to recreate those from a recording. Uh, okay. and so uh, we, will, we will work that out and at a future meeting present those. Um, and I will not take time uh, today to try to figure out how to do that. Um, public comment, we don't have anyone out there in the seats. Uh, but we did receive a public comment via email, and it, they asked that it be kind of read into the public record, and I'll hand it into our public meetings and someone can come, um, and I will do that. And maybe I'll actually take a breath. <laughs> um, it says, uh, this is from CPAC, and it says, Dear Committee, we appreciate the time and work being done by the Fort River Feasibility Study Committee Working Group and the uh, collaboration, in collaboration with the architects to consider this project. Providing for an uh, effective learning environment for our students is very important, and the review of the building and potential renovation plans is critical. While developing possible scenarios for this proposal, we are grateful that members of our Special Education Parent Advisory Council have been part of this group of the group <coughs> planning that takes into consideration the needs of students with disabilities is something that we believe to be essential. The Amherst Public School District values inclusion and the work and recommendations of the group needs to reflect this value. As you proceed with your work, review potential floor plans, we hope you will consider our shared perspective that the special education specialized programs be, lo be in locations near the general education classrooms. Access to and inclusion in the general education learning environment is a priority and the layout of the building will be important to support this instructional model. Thank you for your work keep, and keeping the inclusiveness of our special education programs as a top priority, and signed Nancy Stewart, CPAC president, and also signed by Faye Brady, director of student services. So we will add that to our record. Um, now, moving on, we ha will have quorum for about an hour because Diane has to go. And I did hear from Allison that she wasn't able to come. <coughs> Um, and so uh, I hope we can get through a lot of this <laughs> in the next hour. <laughs> um, before we dive into the public outreach, I just want to touch base with Anthony on the geotech about whether or not we need a vote on what you just sent around. Um, I think we voted on the, the last one, so it probably make sense to. This reflects comments from Jesse, and, and you reviewed them. Um, Jim McPherson has not offered any sub comments on this draft. I would like to at least check it with him see if he notices anything, but it's still 80% uh, his scope. It, uh, it eliminates the second item, which I think did probably just cause confusion. Um, reduces the number of borings to six uh, and changes some of the uh, details around that, but is still basically we're just trying to get this under 10. So um, I'll be soliciting the same people, and um, yeah, I'll hold those to it. Okay. So a couple of things. Um, is in the geotech request, does it specify the locations, or do we still maintain some flexibility? It's basically just six at a depth of at least 25, and then one at 60. Uh, we say propose. We, we highlight them as proposed boring locations, which I think, which I took take to mean that's where we'd like them. But if they, if the engineer has a reason to think that one should be moved, we would consider it. So will we have, are we going to be talking about 
location any further, or is this the time to talk about it? If we want I to think go? we can, because it's not specific, we can talk about it further and make sure that everybody feels like we've got the right locations. I mean, I mean, it, should yeah. we talk about it now, or should we just kind of, you know, plunge on with you know getting this out there, getting what we're going to need to get done? We'll I would encourage us to to move it forward. So yeah. it, it just can we put it as a future yes, right. agenda? I don't know. I'm, so moving the boring within the affordable site while keeping the same number of borings would not affect the price proposal in any way. So it's price, right? Assuming it's still accessible from the same rig? Yeah. I would think so. Okay. If you want to bore in the river down the road. Yeah, it could be through the woods. Yeah, <laughs> that could be a different matter. Okay. And the other question I had was, um, I think Allison had mentioned that she had the names of some other companies, and I just didn't know if that was still going to happen, or does it need to happen with some other people to solicit from? Uh, I had forgotten that she had offered that, but I'll email her before. I, I'd like to send it Monday, so I'll yeah, email yeah. her after the meeting and see if she wants to send me a contact. I'm happy to include okay. Other comments and questions? I have the same one. I have the same okay. one about the if we could have a motion then to uh, to authorize this to go out. Move to authorize this RFQ for geotechnical services. A second. Sorry. Okay. All in favor? Great. Okay. <coughs> um, so uh, next is to review uh, your updated presentation. Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, this I think of as a dry run of our community outreach uh, reach with the school committee next week. And what we've done is prepared printed handouts, two images per page. Uh, we also have a PowerPoint presentation. I have not timed this. We, I believe we're asked if we could keep it 20 minutes. It would be interesting for me to know just how long it runs so that if necessary, we can pare it down. Um, with well, that in mind, should we let you run through it and see how long it yes, takes? And then put if you don't mind, if you don't mind, um, sort of timing sections of it, and that way I, I'll know what where we're running late. Just tell me when you like to have a section. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, uh, my typical is one slide per minute. I don't know. It'll be less than one slide. Okay. Can, can I can I ask another question? Yeah. Are you going to lay out? Any expectations in advance around <coughs> committee questions? Um, I just have one slide that sort of talks about presentation goals. No, I'm saying, are you going to tell people to have their questions at the end of the presentation? Oh, I see. Um, oh, when we're when we're meeting with the school. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good idea. I think the school. <coughs> that won't be well, I'm just, I'm just. If we want to get through in 20 I'm minutes. I'm just forewarning <laughs> you that knowing our committee, yes. Um, the timing exercise we're about to do will be irrelevant to the actual length of the presentation unless you ask them to hold their questions to the end. I see. <laughs> okay. Because of their eagerness to. Yeah, they'll, in, they'll interrupt the first slide. <laughs> Say, what does TSKP stand for? Well, that's part of, that's part of my presentation. Um, anyway, um, so we can start now, okay. and I'll try to delineate where I'm changing sections. So uh, the first point is that I, I, we have certain goals that we would like to achieve in this presentation, one of which is to introduce who we are, who TSKP is. The second is to give the school committee an update on the work that the building committee has been doing along with us in developing some options. Uh, we would like to then review those options uh, with the school committee and then at the end of that request some feedback. We would like your input. This is a work in progress. We are not at the conclusion of our feasibility study, but we think it's important we're at this stage. So let's start with the first question, which is who is TSKP? TSKP is an architectural firm uh, with offices in Hartford and in Boston. Both Jesse and I are from the Hartford office, uh, and we've been involved since the beginning of this project. The firm was founded in 1970, and in previous iterations it was known as Tyson Q Partners, and then hence it's become known as TSKP Studio. Uh, I'm one of the four partners in the firm. If you look at the body of our work in schools, you'll see that there are certain things that are similar in, in those projects, one of which is the work is very simple, and I think it's very appropriate in school work to keep it simple. Um, we, we believe that our work also is very child-friendly. 
Um, we try to scale the project so that its components are more in keeping with the size of children. Uh, we, for instance, try to have fun with some details. You see round windows, square windows in this particular project, which is a, a early childhood project. It also features green uh, building technologies, such as, in this case, using salvaged wood from uh, storm-damaged trees that were then recycled to be on a, a rain screen system applied to this building. Um, natural light is another feature of the work that we've done. If we can achieve a building that minimizes the use of electric um, light fixtures so that you can use them during the day without turning on your lights, then we've achieved a lot, and that's always been one of our goals. Um, we believe in creating spaces that are multifunctional. It, it creates a much more efficient use of square footage. So, for example, in this case, um, we use uh, gymnasium as well as an auditorium. Uh, sometimes we use uh, the stage that faces the gymnasium or faces the cafeteria as another example. We believe in specifying beautiful and durable <coughs> products. We think that that's in the long-term best interest of the schools because once you have those systems installed, um, you want to minimize operational and maintenance costs in the future so that when we do budgeting for a project, we keep that in mind so that the budgets are appropriately uh, prepared. Connections to the outdoors are very important. In this case, which is also an early childhood project, uh, you'll see that the windows are placed in a location so that little people can see outside very easily. These days, uh, security is very, very important in school planning. We're very aware of that. One of my partners served on the Connecticut task force after the Sandy Hook event on the governor's guidelines for school security. So we're very familiar with the details that need to be incorporated in a project, such as making sure that school administration can monitor uh, entrances into the building and keeping those entrances to a minimum. Okay, so that's who we are. Let's talk a little bit about what we've done for your uh, feasibility study. Uh, one of the things we did is we investigated the existing conditions. We sent all of our consultants, which include mechanical electrical engineers, site engineers, site planners, structural engineers, and sustainable consultants to the existing Fort River School to examine it and its site. And we divided that investigation into three components. One is the infrastructure, what kinds of improvements are necessary now to just bring the infrastructure up to speed. Second is educational needs. How does the existing building fall short to meeting your educational goals? The third is security aspects. We prepare those existing conditions reports, which are under separate cover that I can submit to the building. Um, we examine the roof. We examine exterior walls, which are uninsulated. We examine mechanical systems. And we examine the footprint of the existing building, which was built in the early 1970s. The pictures on the lower right-hand corner are some examples of schools that were built at that time. Uh, movable walls, open classrooms. That was what people did at that time. And the school is, uh, is a good example what happened during that era. Not only this school, but its sister school in town, Wildwood School, is also built using exactly the same plans. And if you examine the plans, you'll see that you have open classrooms um, in those quadrants, those quads. Each of those classrooms, those open spaces are divisible into four sub-classrooms, sub-spaces, some of which don't have adequate natural daylighting, in my opinion, which creates a need for passage around the spaces, uh, resulting in classrooms that are quite small. Some of these classrooms are 725 square feet. There's one there that's 706. Uh, just to put that in perspective, if you look at the state guidelines, if you're getting funding from MSBA, for example, the MSBA requires that you have classrooms at 900. So that's the minimum, 900 square feet. So that kind of puts you in perspective of what the state of the art is 
for school planning versus what you have. Another aspect of this plan is that the common areas, such as the cafeteria, the gymnasium, the media center, those kinds of spaces that are very often used by the community for meetings and after hour activities are dispersed in the footprint. So you can't get to those spaces unless you go through the academic areas. That creates some security issues. And in current thinking, you need to create those kinds of common spaces that have access directly from the outside without having to go through the classroom spaces. Uh, these are just some photographs of the existing classrooms. Uh, inadequate daylight. Some of these rooms are quite dim. And then there are these very small courtyards uh, with no accessibility to them. Accessibility is a problem in not only within the building, but outside the building as well. These are just some examples of the tiered seating, the step seating in the media center, the inaccessible courtyards, uh, the bathrooms that are really outdated. Outside, we have walks that don't meet current standards for accessibility. Um, and this was an investigation done that was done by our, our site consultant. Okay, next section, let's talk about enrollment analysis. We did look at the enrollment projections for the school. Uh, and this tabulation shows you in the upper left-hand corner the current enrollment for grades K through 6, which is 1,076. That projection shows a fairly level uh, population in the future, although school, administ school, administra school, sorry, school administration believes that if you go to a, a dual language program at the Fort River School, that that population will be reconfigured in the district. So the population in Fort River would be increasing from the present 315 to 420 grades K through 6, and the other schools would be adjusted down a little bit. Population derives the space needs for your school. So if you look at the um, range of existing to proposed population from 350 to 420, um, there's a certain square footage that, you, is, that is calculated, again, using certain standards, including the MSBA standards. One factor in the options discussion has been this pre-K part of the program. So we did pull that out. There's 45 pre-K uh, pupils that could be added. So the population of 420 could become 465 at the Fort River School. And so uh, we're projecting a square footage of 84,000 square feet for the Fort River School, if you include pre-K classrooms. How does that compare to the existing? The existing is 78,000 square feet. Now, if you look at the MSBA guidelines for a population of 465, the MSBA says you should have a school of about 72,700 square feet. And they have a formula that they use and they don't take pre-K into account. They take the classrooms, but not the administration. So Sorry. The space. Like part of the admin areas for pre-K, they don't count. So that's why their, their square footage is a little bit less. There are other factors into why we believe we need a larger footprint, and that's because you have certain guidelines for populations per classroom, your goal is 20, whereas MSBA, their projection is 24, typically, in classroom populations. So if you have fewer pupils per classroom, you need more classrooms. That's a fact. In addition to that, you have the district special ed um, requirements. You have AIMS as well as building blocks program at Fort River. That adds square footage, uh, as well as the pre-K admin and support that I mentioned. So that's how we come up with 85,000 according to MSBA. We use the MSBA guidelines as an adjustment. But for our planning purposes, we're using the target number of 84,000 square feet for grades pre-K through 6 at Fort Wayne. Uh, this chart compares the other elementary schools with Fort River, Wildwood, and Crocker Farm. 
proceed with square footages for each of the existing schools, 71,000 roughly at Crocker Farm, 78,000 for Fort River and Wildwood. Very, I guess this is a repeat of similarly what we did in the previous slide. Well, actually, if what we wanted to do here is, is look at Crocker Farm. One of the items that we discussed with the building committee, they, they asked us, go look at Crocker Farm. We think Crocker Farm works pretty well. Uh, we, so we did visit Crocker Farm. We also visited Wildwood so that we could get a better understanding of all three schools. And um, if we were to adjust the Crocker Farm square footage to use the gymnasium size per MSBA guidelines, and if we also added the district um, special ed programs, then Crocker Farm would have to be adjusted upward to roughly 82,000 square feet. Population also drives, uh, in addition to square footage, is the curriculum spaces or the classroom spaces that are necessary in the school. And the building committee asked the school administration to come up with a list of spaces that would be appropriate for a school of this size. So we do have in our study a complete tabulation of the anticipated spaces, the number of classrooms. For example, we have three free kindergarten rooms. We have three kindergarten rooms. We have 18 general classrooms. That's all part of the planning for the future school. Next section uh, we'd like to talk about is sustainability and net zero. Because in Amherst, you have some town bylaws, some regulations that now come into play, which is that new buildings need to adhere to net zero goals. So I'm going to ask Jesse to walk us through what that means for your project. Thanks, Richard. Um, well, first thing we want to hit on is that sustainability is very important to us. All the work we do um, is sustainable, and this is a more holistic view of a project than the net zero requirement, which Richard just referenced. This is that we're looking for our schools to be safe and healthy, resource efficient in general, flexible and adaptable to handle future changes so that we're not having to redo or tear down our buildings, and then durable and maintainable. Um, but we want to talk a little more about the energy side, um, which is where your net zero bylaw comes into play. Um, this slide shows the sort of ratcheting down of energy codes over time as they affect the energy use in our buildings. So you can see in the 1980s, our energy use could be as high as 100. But now, um, with LEED version 4, which this project would fall under, energy use would need to be below 50. Um, and, and that's something I think you're aware of, that codes keep getting more stringent. Well, net zero adds another component to reducing our energy usage in a building. Uh, you can see our, this slide shows the energy demand dropping, similar to the last slide. But we're not able to make our energy usage go away completely. Of course, we're going to use some energy. So net zero uh, requires us to introduce renewable energy. Uh, this is probably solar panels, photovoltaics. Um, and, and so by introducing renewable energy, we're able to offset the energy used in our building and achieve a, a net zero condition of zero energy use. And that's the idea. Um, this slide talks about possible energy targets for Fort River. Uh, to the second to the bottom is a typical green building, which is what we might do if we weren't pursuing net zero. It wouldn't involve renewable energy, but we could have a source EUI of about 55, and it would have less energy cost per year than a, an average building, which is at the top. Whereas a net zero building would have zero energy use and zero energy costs because those renewables are able to offset all of the energy use on the site in, in the project. Um, this slide is just to remind us that if we're accepted to the MSBA pipeline for this project, that their funding is contingent upon achieving uh, lead certification or CHIPS verification. Uh, we also need to be 10% better than energy code to achieve any funding from the state. So these are targets we have in mind. Um, the committee's asked us to pursue uh, a project which would be certified as, as part of our budgeting and study. Um, and then finally, our six mechanical options, uh, which I don't have time to go through in great detail. 
I can tell you that we're studying all six of these in our study. Um, the bottom one, option six, uh, was a request from Mr. McPherson, the facilities director, because he felt it was the most maintainable. Uh, and so that's the basis for our study, but we're also looking at all of the other five. Um, it happens that the, the bottom one, while maybe the most maintainable, also has the highest operational cost. And so considering our net zero goals, we, we need to keep, keep everything on the table. And so we're going forward with all six. Okay, I'm going to briefly, briefly walk you through the design options that we've been examining with the building committee. There are a total of seven, A, B, C, D, E, and F. In six of them, we achieve these design options. These were identified as non-negotiable options that have to be incorporated in our solutions. And so we've achieved all of them, every one that you see on this list, from natural light in all of the classrooms to uh, environmental analysis. Uh, so let, let's talk about that. So when you look at the variables, the factors that we've been examining in the study, which is do we build new? Do we renovate? Do we do a combination of new and renovate in various degrees? Do we include pre-K or don't we include pre-K? We come up with quite a number of options. In fact, the total is 147 options. So I'm going to share with you a matrix that kind of goes through that, but I just want to touch upon these very, very quickly. So the range is from 100% new on the left, that's option A, to option F on the extreme right which is base repair option. This does not achieve those goals that I just showed you on the previous slide. What it does do, it establishes a base repair number. If you're not concerned about achieving, I shouldn't say that, if you just want to have a base to compare with the other options, and if you, if you do nothing except just repair the building, that's option F. So that's the range of options that we've been so let's start with A, which is 100% new. So that's represented by the blue rectangle that you see in this aerial diagram, or in plan form. Uh, the dotted line um, represents the footprint of the existing building. So the concept here is that new building would be built, and this illustration shows a two-story new building placed adjacent to the existing building, just south of the existing building. Uh, and then after that's built, uh, you move, move into the new building and the old, the old building can be demolished and the site improvements can be finished. So what are the pink areas? The pink areas represent photovoltaic panels that would be placed on the roof, would be placed on the ground in order to achieve net zero in the new building. Remember your regulation that says if you're building a new building, you have to achieve net zero. So in order to do that, we would have to have photovoltaic panels in that quantity to achieve that. Um, very briefly, option A, the new option, is a two-story building. Common areas are located on the ground floor, so you have media center, gymnasium, cafeteria, and then you have classrooms both on the ground level and on the second level. And pre-K is shown in the lower right corner Sorry that this isn't visible. Hopefully it's visible in the school committee meeting. Uh, they they also have a screen, but. but then I'll use a old fashioned pointer and I'll point to it. So yeah. in the lower right corner of the ground floor is the pre-K option. That can be either in the plan or not in the plan. For the sake of this study and these diagrams, we're including in the three pre-K classes. Okay, let's look at option B. Option B represents 50% new construction, 50% renovation. So in this case, we would be building a new building, a two-story building shown represented by this blue rectangular area adjacent to the existing footprint. And then once the new building is built, we would be able to phase into the new building, occupy that portion, vacate a portion of the existing building, do some renovation work, eventually removing uh, portion of the existing building, ending up then with 50% new and 50% renovation. Now in this case, there's fewer 
photovoltaic panels required because only the new building needs to be net zero. And so you end up with, as you can see in this diagram, um, the reconfiguration of the play fields after the building is completed. And this diagram represents what is new, which is in blue. The gray area is what's the renovated area, and the tan area is the areas that would be removed. And you can see that we're removing a portion of the media center in the center and creating a larger courtyard in the middle, which looks like this. So every classroom has natural light. Every classroom is on the perimeter of the building, either on the perimeter on the outside or facing that courtyard that's located in the center. The common areas are all collected together, so that area can be opened after hours without having people go into the educational or the academic areas. The administrative area is located adjacent to the main entry, so that the main entry can be monitored for security purposes from the administrative area, as you can see. Uh, the difference between option B and option B1 is the pre-K. Pre-K is option B1, and in this case, we have pre-K located here in the lower left-hand corner. The upper level of uh, this option has academic space. Uh, option C, I'm sorry, and that, that was a two-story addition. This option C is a one-story building addition, which represents 29% new and 71% renovation. And we chose to look at the possibility of adding new construction to the north side of the building, as you can see here. And in this option, we're also creating a courtyard in the center. Less or fewer photovoltaic panels are required because the new construction is smaller. The renovation is larger, the new construction is smaller, but we're still removing a portion of the existing building, the cafeteria, kitchen area, and the center area is being removed. So that again, we end up with classrooms, all of the exterior window walls facing outside on the perimeter or facing the courtyard in the center. In this option, the entrance is on the left side of this footprint, and all of the common areas are located on the left side in this one story condition. Option D is a smaller addition. It's only 18% new and 82% renovation work. Smaller photovoltaics. Less demolition, less new construction. Again, it's a courtyard scheme, placing all of the classrooms on the perimeter or facing the courtyard with natural daylight. In this case, the main entrance is favored more toward the right. We relocated the admin to the front of the building for security reasons, and we're showing the pre K in the lower right corner of the plan. That is option D1. Option E is a very small addition, primarily just for pre-K, and relatively few photovoltaic systems because the only portion that truly has to be net zero is new construction only. Very small addition. And again, similar kind of strategy for getting exterior walls to all of the classrooms. Now, it, this option still uses the gym in the, in the left-hand side of the footprint, so we still have this issue of not collecting all of the common areas. We still have to travel through um, academic areas to get to gymnasium after hours. And then finally, option F, which is just uh, bringing the building up to code and bringing the building up to speed in terms of some of its infrastructure, but does not address the open classroom areas, does not create those kinds of exterior perimeter spaces for all the classrooms. This, uh, the, all these options, of which there are 147, if you look at this matrix, are being costed. In fact, we've already had one round of costing done. Um, for, for the sake of this committee, I'm telling you this, I'm 
we're not going to be prepared because we need to vet all those numbers in time. It just seems like we have time to do that for the school committee. So I need to present this blank matrix that will be populated with costs um, at a subsequent meeting. Um, but this kind of shows you all the range of options. We were hired to do options. I think we've developed quite a number of options um, for the committee's further consideration. That's, that's where we are as a presentation. 27 minutes. That's without interruption. Yeah. Right. Should we start some feedback? Yes, right. please. I mean, I, I think we would want to make it a little bit shorter. My personal gut is that we could, I, mean, I kind of like the way that one slide about the, the site is condensed. Now, maybe we can't condense the existing building slide that slides that much, but if we could tighten up that piece, because I, I think the school committee is pretty aware of the, the issues in and around the building, and that we could, instead of maybe cutting back from three or four slides, to just okay. make it a, a little a little tighter. Okay. Um, Existing conditions investigation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So, for, so you know, that was, um, the existing conditions took about four minutes. Okay. Um, and the, the, the Topic. The, the headline one was about four minutes as well, oh. just so you know. Okay. Well, we can cut that in half. Um, the enrollment stuff, I mean, I thought it was all kind of interesting and relevant, but it also seemed very in the weeds. I don't know if that's a place that could be yeah. hacked. Um, yeah, I don't personally have a suggestion of quite how to tighten yeah. it up, but if there's a way to, to, to make it tighter. I think that's a good place to leave. We always leave things for questions. I think you can, for okay. enrollment, you can compress it. I think the first slide makes sense. And maybe, uh, um, yeah, the first, maybe the first two. And probably there's going to be questions, and they're going to ask you how that they compare. So then you have the slides ready to answer those questions. I can certainly but do that, yeah. You don't need to answer all the questions up front. You can leave some for. So if I understand you said keep the comparison to MSBA guidelines. Keep the comparison to put, the... Put the comparison to Crocker Farm and the existing schools in the resource. Yeah. Pull that yeah, out. maybe. That. Or maybe have it there, show it, but not that into it, and if then they may come out after. Would so that they, they know that you have the information that you look at it, but not necessarily that you're going to be explaining all the details. Sure. The I can control. just quickly flash it and say we looked at all of the schools, and then we can answer any questions about those. I'm going to push back and say okay. no. <laughs> um, um, I think it's important to talk about it. So rather than do that, I would, um, you know how you've got the two slides about um, uh, these two, the right size and with, without, you know, the, with and without the MSBA. I would just get rid of the first one that doesn't have the MSBA on, right? Okay. And then I think that, and I might do the same thing. Um, on the bottom, or actually there, get rid of the bottom one where you go into the elaborate, you know, the, the big comparison to Crocker Farm. I think it's important for people to know, to get a vision in their head of, I, I can picture Wildwood, Crocker Farm, Fort River, I have a sense of how big they are, and this is giving them a sense of what you're talking about for that 420, 465, and actually the 350. I think it, it, that what might be more confusing is um, is having the, the 315 to 420 mm. in, that, in that first bid. So maybe you could put the, you know, leave the, the current size of uh, Fort River, the 315, in that second bunch of slides. But really the point that we're getting at is this is what we're looking to build and this is in, in the yeah. MBA guidelines. So, I yeah, I, I, I think idea. there were four slides here. I think we could probably do it in one slide. Or, or two. two. Or maybe two. Yeah. Okay. The 420 comes up from us, not from the MSB right. guidelines. No. So I think 420 is an important number to target. Yeah, yeah and I think no, we're not, Yeah, but we're saying, yeah, the, the, I mean, to, to say the 420 is with, with both MSBA and what we're working on. So that's, that's why we're, they need to know why we're talking about that. I want to comment the, on the slide with the, this one. Yes. Uh, the range for one wood, the color coding is not right. 
you're correct. It's, it's a duplication of Fort it's River. A, it's a duplication of Fort River, but it's very different. And I think that has an impact um, because right now, what we discuss, Fort 16 or Fort 20, um, so it's at the target number that we are going. But the color coding is quite different from uh, Fort River. So we make, make it more generic if you don't have the. Yeah. Uh, it's mainly, I think, uh, Wildwood mainly is every quad is three to four occupied by classrooms. I you think that. Okay. Uh, okay. For sure, all of them are three, and I think there is one that is the full, full quad is four classrooms. Eric, what's, what's the point of the slide? I mean, to me, I, what I'm like, what I'm going to get at is, to me, you're moving from three fifteen to four twenty, right? You're relating that to the adoption of dual language and the yep. assumption of the need for three classrooms per grade. Yep. You're then saying that that absent any immediate projection or current projection of overall enrollment growth, that that'll then have an impact on the enrollment in the other schools and at least are cognizant of that fact, right? Yep. That's correct. Right. So who cares about these illustrations? No, no, I'm saying why even show them at all? Because you're getting into a discussion which is absolutely pointless and contrary to the, I mean, this feasibility committee is not designed to reprogram Crocker or Wildwood. Mm -hmm. It's to come up with a rationale for why you have a number for Fort River. So I personally would, I mean, if, if we're gonna, I, I don't disagree with what Arena is saying, that if, if the programming that's shown in the illustrations is inaccurate, just get rid of the illustrations because it's not actually the point of the slide. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, they, those diagrams are distracting. It's just creating false precision yeah. Yeah. around it. Unless we want to make clear the programming, how much space it takes in different schools. Um, I mean, it may not hurt to have at the back of the, yeah. the set if a question comes up about the schools back there. But I, I, I agree with Eric that I don't think I don't think it does anything for this slide to have that information there. And certainly, if there's something wrong, we don't want to show something. So what we can do is try to clear, try to correct Wildwood, put that as a resource slide in case the question comes up and then we can show how they compare. But it's distracting on this slide. There's really only one message, as Eric described. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing, it, with having the numbers there, I, I don't, has the district said that, you know, if you build a 420, Fort River School, then the you know, people, I think people are going to zoom in on, oh, wait a minute, you know, so Crocker's going to go from 345 to 290. I think yeah. people might get distracted by that. I don't know if that's solid um, data from the administration's estimate. They did say, they, yeah. they gave yeah. you those numbers. Okay, so I wasn't aware that they had talked about that. I mean, I can understand if you want to take this enrollment discussion outside of the feasibility study. Um, it does seem like um, if you're talking about a certain size school, you're likely to be asked, well, that school is larger than our current school. Is it based on enrollment projection going up? Which isn't really the case. We have enrollment projections, but they're not showing the district increasing over time. So this was a logical explanation for why the uh, enrollments increased. Is that our scope? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't actually think it is. And I think that my understanding is the district answered the question of what the impact might be on the other schools because you asked it. If you hadn't asked the question, what's the impact, what's the potential impact on the other schools, I don't think they would have gone through this modeling exercise of saying, oh, well, if we have 420 and Fort River, what is that implication? The only feedback I've heard from the superintendent on this is that it's probably a good message that if we were to build a larger school at Fort River, and if there was a draw right. from uh, Crocker in particular, maybe more than Wildwood, then it might relieve some of the space pressure mm -hmm. they have at Crocker, which is a good thing. Sure. And that, that's not a bad message to say that if we're modeling a school that's at 420, that's related also to the adoption of dual language, and we think that that might have a, you know, that's, that's a nice message to have, but I think there's, to me, there's just a lot of, it's projecting beyond the scope of the feasibility committee. And I think I actually agree with what Maria said, that I think too many audiences could look at those numbers 
and infer that decisions are being made or planned that in fact aren't. Right. I mean, it's just, this is really just an answer to a question of what conceivably could be the impact of having a larger enrollment at Fort River. I mean, that's all it is. Right. And, and, and I think that um, the material point that you make is if you have increased enrollment at Fort River, that, you know, that I, want, would, I would want people to come away with the, the knowledge that so that means, you know, if we stay level with enrollment, that that eases, and it's not right. just Wildwood, eases um, space constraints at Wildwood and and Yeah, Park. which is a good thing. So good 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 somehow good. getting that across without putting like numbers down to like, uh, you know, that that look that specific. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think you could also make the point of, um, uh, in the case of increased enrollment in the district, which over the 50-year life of new building, right. if those numbers go up and you have a larger scale, you know, this gives you... Sure, it gives you some cushion, which yeah. is good planning. And, but, but we started out with what's the target number, right? Yeah. And I think as a group we said 420 is the mm -hmm. right, right number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and by the way, that has some other benefits too, which yeah. is that if you do right. fill it with 420, you can relieve some pressure on the other And maybe to say, how did we get to that? Because I don't know that we, that in this, I know we've talked about how we got to the 420, but in the presentation to the school committee to say, that's three classes per grade at 20 per, you know, just yeah. to give them the, the math on it. Yeah. Right, and that's and actually a good, yeah, that's and not shown. And then also, yeah. I th also, I think to me, to me, um, it goes, it, to me, it goes to sort of the larger point of the presentation is that to me, I think, apart from just informing people about what's going to be in the feasibility study, part of the exercise is to lay out um, what are the components, what are the deliverables, and sort of what's the rationale behind the deliverables, right? You know, and so one of, the, one of those is if you pick a number like 420, is that based on anything in a way that feels realistic. So that goes to that goes to this slide on what the enrollment is and how you come up with that number and it doesn't make sense. I think it also goes to the other discussion about uh, blocking out the space from the square footage and saying, you know, especially with the um, inclusion of building blocks and aims at Fort River uh, and, and uh, I don't know, different classroom, average classroom sizes, that there's a logic to why the number is what it is but I think once you've laid out what that logic is and the sort of rationale and why it's defensible, you're done, right? Meaning, it, meaning anything else beyond that starts getting into a level of precision around those particular elements that's beyond what's necessary. Maybe, in my view, maybe even beyond what's desirable. Because in the end, this is a this is a this is a conceptual analysis which right. is trying to look at different options and look at the feasibility of different options. Um, we're not act I mean, not to beat a dead horse on this, but we're not actually going to choose one of these options and build it literally. Mm -hmm. It's going to inform a conversation which is going to help the community plan out buildings. And, and I probably should kind of reinforce that. It's, it's very easy for any of us to kind of slip into language that makes it sound like there's going to be a building coming directly out of this. There won't be. Um, and so we just all have to be very careful when we're talking. We talk when we talk here. We try to be careful, but when we're talking more publicly um, about how this is a feasibility-focused study that that will inform the town, but then it'll have to be picked up in another way. And, and, and yeah, so and today. just to, to tag on this, and I'll, I'll stop in two seconds. But that that's sort of one of my general feedback to the presentation is one. Uh, I would call us the feasibility committee, not the building committee, mm -hmm. or feasibility study committee, not the building. Committee. Uh, and two, a, a few times in the presentation, your language talked about guiding decisions around future choices. And I think you should also be careful about that and speak with more precision about the fact that ultimately the deliverable of this report, of this process, is going to be um, a set of analytics and data and modeling that's going to help our community make really better decisions about how we proceed with the future elementary school building uh, on the site. That's the point of it. And so part of the reason why you go, I mean, my view, part of the reason why you go through all the different options and present them, part of the reason why you have the different approaches to energy, you know, HVAC or whatever, energy generation on the site, 
is because you want to provide as rich uh, a set of feedback, resources, and analysis to the community to understand what the viability of different alternatives are and what the trade-offs are from them. It's not actually so that the committee at some point between now and April can say, uh, well, we want, one, we want A and B and we don't want C through F, or vice versa, we want D and E and we don't want A and B. That's not actually, we're not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Can I talk about a different slide? Sure. Okay. Um, the possible en energy targets for Fort River. There's um, uh, some jargony stuff in there, and there's some more numbers, which I, um, I'm not sure that your point's going to come across. The site EUI and the source EUI, and I don't think that... I, I Just think drop it, the slide. That's what I mean. No. <laughs> no. Well, no, I think I know, there's some important stuff. That, yeah. I yeah. No, I, I just think to maybe... But, it down. Uh, make it so that the layperson, the layperson yeah. can understand that, yeah. and also um, you know there's these energy costs, and again people are gonna people glom onto specific numbers. So they're just like, well, if we do this, 160,947 dollars, you know, per annum, right? So I just um, to, I yeah, I know you know, I'm dealing with engineers. You know, they I like know. to calculate to the which is great to decimal places, but um, but I'm not sh I don't know that I guess. If this could be get the point across with something that's more easily understood by everybody. What did this add to the what point did this make? Well, for me, the important point is here that um, if you if you build a green building, which we're obligated to do at a minimum, your annual cost is estimated to be approximately fifty eight thousand dollars per year. But can I can you do it as a percentage of current or average cost like maybe as a if you don't want to the numbers like fifty thousand dollars or fifty six thousand dollars maybe as a percentage of average cost right at the bottom where it says green building represents a fifty one percent reduction we could change it to fifty one percent reduction is that that way you're not, you're not giving dollar value do i not giving dollar values yeah or do you, i mean it, it's hard to put, it's hard for me to put this in, i don't know what the what we're actually spending per year. You know, this, this slide doesn't tell me, like, what are we currently Good spending point. that for? Good point. How much are you spending today? I thought Jim and Pearson had given you the numbers. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, it's, it's not far from that average okay. 116,000. Um, it varies year to year and everything, yeah. so I can't say exactly, but it was over 100. Yeah. Just something to, to, to get somebody, to really get your feet on the ground and know, what am I, I don't know, what am I supposed to be taking out of this slide? What are you supposed to take away from this slide? Right, I feel like the one previous was important to explain why we have all the solar feed PVs that renewable energy is offsetting our energy demand which we're bringing down. But when I get to this one, I'm not, I'm not sure. This gives you a sense of benchmarking, but we never refer to it later. So. I just don't, I mean, in all seriousness, I look at it and I say to myself, uh, hey, I'd like zero. Right, because I mean, that's what the town has to buy. We don't have any other options. Like none of these are options because we have to meet the net zero. No, so. but, yeah. whether, but whether <laughs> whether they are or not, I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm like, so my energy cost could be zero or 116000 dollars a year. I'll take zero, and then because the real point would be, well, how do you achieve that? What are the cost trade off? I mean, what are, you know what I mean? Like there are other questions you'd ask around. I have to say, I find it more impactful to see the. The, you know the 3D views yeah. with the fields of PV. Yeah. I mean that told me yeah. something about okay that, that I now problem. get what it means to get to net zero in a in a graph. Well, way. that that and also I think rather than in my view rather than this slide, what you what you didn't really speak to you sp on the slides that showed fewer PV and um, less of a wholesale re renovation or re reconstruction of the site. You said that the current building uh, portions are exempt from the net zero law. Um, but then what we didn't hear is we didn't hear, okay, and so what's the impact then mm -hmm. on the energy efficiency mm -hmm. of that space, Good right? And, like, and yeah. to me, that's almost a more important yeah. point to me than this. Well, it would be Agreed. relating the different options to, okay, which if of, of A, well, the E through E, which one of them is most like the high performance, you know, it, it, of this of this slide? Like, kind of where does it fit in? It 
probably, it, it, for, for the purposes of this specific presentation, it may be TMI altogether. Yeah, I, 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 I'm leaning that Oh, way. I think it is. That I would I mean, drop to, this to me, slide. To me, the, to me the, importance yeah. of it, the importance of this and a couple other slides where you go into the weeds, yeah. in my view, is not that you'd actually want to discuss that level of information with the committee and the public. It's more a matter minutes. of saying, <laughs> hey, look, we, we this is the level of homework we've done right. so that when we spit out deliverables later that are analyzing what we think the costs are going to be, Incredibly. we're not just right. coming up with numbers out of the back of a book. It's based on a real honest to God analysis, and this shows you that we're doing our homework. Right. To me, that's the. That's really the best. They may insult you, by the way, by saying that. I'm sure you want to share <laughs> all the details of your learning. Yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> but, I, you give but, us an hour. but then you get too much information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You do. That irrelevant information for the purpose of that meeting. Yeah. I think also that the, one of the details of all the options. So, yeah. Which back, I think it's too much detail. I think you can't mention that we are looking at a range, or maybe it's at the end. But I think the committee is going to be more interested in looking at the last part of the presentation. The, the, the beginning. There's going to be a lot more interest because they have the, we've seen all the blueprints. Right. We have all the designs. Right. We know what they're talking about. People are going to be more interested in these. And I think people are assuming that we are looking into all the, these other things. So I think, or, or yes, we have to bring it. But I think we have to make an emphasis of all the options that we are looking at, the designs, and what do they plan. I second the notion of highlighting the inefficiencies of some of the other models, though, because our building is highly inefficient right now. Yeah. So if we yeah. continue to use the existing building to a large percentage, we're going to remain completely inefficient for well, years no, to come. Well, no, we'll improve its efficiency mm -hmm. through the renovation. So, I mean, that could be a use for this slide that we were just about to jettison, is that we could say that, well, a renovation project would be a green building or high performance wherever we end up, but it would be improved whereas the new construction would be net zero. Right. But I'm, I'm wondering, though, if those figures that we're talking about shouldn't go on that slide, that and we, the photovoltaic diagram that right. says, and as a consequence, you will mm -hmm. have zero annual net Yeah, that's, where you, that's yeah. where you want the, to me, that's where you want to bring in that information. Mm -hmm. so like, Better. In the yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, the other place we can talk about this a little bit is on your non-negotiable slide. Yeah. You don't talk about, um, sort of meeting current energy codes in there as a non-negotiable. So even like mm -hmm. bringing it up to code repair, I could mm -hmm. I could see you kind of having part of it being this code repair addresses this. And in addition to code repair, all the rest of them address this. So yeah. accessibility mm -hmm. yeah. would be something that's not mentioned on here, which is also a non-negotiable, but would yeah. be included in F. And then bringing the whole building up to energy code, I'm assuming, which is yes. true, right? That's true. Um, so that's another place to kind of talk about it and frame yeah. it. Um, energy code and egress. I mean, we don't even need egress code right now in the building. Like safety, con that's another like safety consideration. Like getting kids to fire exits is a problem right now. So that's another non-negotiable that needs to be added to that list. Okay. And then I saw a couple of things here. Right? So I kind of in a overall um, comment is we might want to clarify how much detail. They, we want them to be focusing on at this point, right? Because you know, again, we're I, the point of this presentation is not for them to look, you know, deeply at the the site plan and say, I really think that that room needs to go over here, or I, you know, maybe to to just set it up and say, at what level are we talking right now? Um, about these plans and um, and about the options, and again, simplifying language, what you were saying about the, the different um, HVAC options, get rid of any jargon, get 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 rid of it. You know, people understand like geothermal or air source heat pumps or something. You know, I think just put it in those kind of. It's just to say we're looking at six mechanical system options, and then. Well, no, I think it would be, I think a little more detail than that, not just, um, I mean, to, to make it clear to people, like, okay, um, but are folks aware that at Fort River we currently have, it's gas, that, that's our energy source, right? So the other potential would be to use geothermal, air source heat pump, you know, it turns that people can, can figure, understand when they're thinking, this is how I heat my house, how are they planning on heating? The building. Yeah. 
the, the jargon of KBTU per square foot per year is just beyond most yeah. people's understanding. And so um, what we can try to do is incorporate that language in more generic terms, mm -hmm. in more plain speak. At this point, I think I have to play timekeeper. Diane has to go yeah, thank you. lose quorum. Back to school, thank you. Um, and so uh, we'll adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.